All right. Welcome to week two of 8215. Um, the good news is we're not going to waste 15 minutes at the beginning introducing myself, so it's going to go pretty okay, uh, pacing-wise. Um, the other thing is, for those of you that have read ahead uh, in the slides, uh, you'll notice that my slides today are slightly out of order. It's all the same slides, I just changed the order so that the content makes a little more sense, or at least I think it does. Um, but it's the exact same content that's there. I just moved about six slides to the front. So don't panic when I suddenly hit a slide you're not expecting to see. It's just out of order. All right, so today we are going to talk about uh, the fundamentals of database design, or I should say the fundamental pieces of database design. Um, we're going to talk about uh, entities and their relationships, uh, attributes, um, and keys for the most part. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about entities. Entities is a concept that fundamentally is very simple. Uh, however, there's times where people struggle with it. And it's just a case of understanding most of the time. So an entity is a thing. Literally, it's a thing. Like you can see the first word is something. It's a thing. Um, but essentially, when we talk about an entity or entities, is we are talking about things that we want to track in a database. So this stuff could be as simple as uh, students. It could be weather, could be concert events. It could be, you know, whether it's a real physical object, like computers, physical people, or imaginary friends. It's, if you want to track it, they're entities. And when we talk about an entity, um, there's, a couple of phrases that get used interchangeably. There's one, there's this entity and entity type. Those two are used interchangeably. They mean the exact same thing. So when you read in a book, even in some textbooks, I've seen them switch back and forth between the two terms uh, a little loosely. They are the exact same thing. And um, so if we want to talk about specific entities, I'm going to start talking using students as my example of a specific entity. Now, you guys are taking Java, but obviously you haven't taken object-oriented programming very much yet, so the whole concept of referring to this as classes and, and attributes is not going to go very well, or classes and properties. However, if I call an entity type or an entity a student, an entity class is a collection of students. An instance is a single student. So in this room, we have an entity called student. It is an entity that will define what the college considers the pertinent information or data about a student. All of you are a entity class. In other words, the, all of you put together, which is kind of funny because this is a class, but it's a entity class, and every single one of you individually is an instance of a student. So here we have an example of a customer entity with two instances. So when we look at the entity, you will notice that it has a name, in this case, customer, and there's a series of properties in it. Those are called attributes, and we'll be talking about attributes in a moment. Uh, but these are the things, for example, in a customer that we worried about tracking. A customer number, a name, street, city, state, zip, contact name, email address. So if this is an entity or an entity type, depending on where you're reading it. And those items, in, which is uh, called customer, and the items inside of it are the attributes of the entity. The two yellow boxes below are two examples of instances. So each yellow box is a collection of all the attributes for a single instance of a customer. The two customers instances put together is an entity class. Now that's literally what that terminology is. So the principal difference between an entity and a table, which we'll be talking about tables towards the end, 
is when you are defining um, a relationship between objects, you don't need keys when you're talking about an entity. When you're talking about a table, you will need keys. And yes, we'll be talking about keys also. Uh, the issue with this particular lecture is a, I'm sure most of you probably have heard the phrase or an equivalent phrase, wherever you're from, the chicken or the egg, which one came first, right? Trying to teach this is a bit chicken and the egg, right? Uh, do I talk about tables first? Or do I talk about entities first? Do I talk about keys first? There's like three or four things I should talk about at the same time. So I just got to pick a point and start. So right now I've got some words on the slide that you guys have never seen before or may not have seen before. Don't worry, they all get explained. Um, so the point of an entity though is for the early design process. When you're first starting out designing a database, you're not going to dive right away and create tables and fields and relationships and all that jazz in the database. You are going to design. Now, usually I ask this and I say, does anybody in here artistic, anybody here draw for fun or paint? And usually nobody ever raises their hand whether they do it or not because they just don't want to be identified as an artsy type. However, if anybody in here has ever drawn, you know that the very first pencil, pen, brush stroke is not going to be a finished piece of work. You might just be drawing, you know, a, a big cross on the middle of your page so you can set your, proper, your proportions right. Entities, attributes, and the initial you know, keys and stuff is the process of building the database. Basically put what you're doing now is rough sketching what the database is. Therefore, the point of having relationships with entities is so that we can express them without having to worry about the technical details. So when we talk about entities, we will have a few different phrases when it talks about keys. Um, the first one is an identifier. So an identifier is an attribute that distinguishes an instance <clears throat> from every other instance of the same entity. Students here at the school, you all have an identifier. What is it? Your student number. And wherever country you're from, you probably have an identifier to your government. Like in Canada, it's a SIN number. Could be a you know an SSN number in the U.S. It, take your pick. The government has a, the U.K. has a different phrase for it. You know they all have different phrases, but you know you have a number that identifies you to whatever government. But here at the school, your identifier is your student number. It allows me or someone to uniquely identify each instance of every student because it makes you unique. You could theoretically have three students in the class with the same name, and yes, it has happened to me where I had three students in a group of 109 that had the exact same name. But their student number is the only way I could tell them apart. So whenever they submitted work, I've required those three to always make sure they include their student number because I had no idea who they were. Um, you know, it's kind of fun when that happens. A primary key is what happens at the end. So you start with an identifier and you end with a primary key. So once you've created your database and you physically create your database, your identifier will probably become a primary key. Uh, we'll talk about that when we're talking about physical design. Candidate key is when you have more than one identifier. So in theory, here at the school, even though right now your identifier, we've said it's your student number, in theory, the school has more than one thing we could use as to identify you. You got your student number. Probably the uh, international students have a, a um, student visa number. Canadian students have a SIN number. You know, American students probably supply their SSN or their passport number. Those numbers are all numbers that might be collected by the school. I really don't know if they collect them, but I'm assuming they do. And the fact that they're, they're student visa number is unique. Your student number is unique. Theoretically, they're both potential identifiers. Therefore, they're considered candidate keys. In other words, we haven't picked which one is going to be the true identifier. So they're both candidates. It's a bit like an election, right? When you got multiple people that want a given position, 
They're all considered candidates until one gets elected into the primary position, in this case, a primary key. So we are going to start out talking about identifiers or potential identifiers and candidate keys, and eventually they'll turn into primary keys way down the road. Which leads me to attributes. So attributes describe an entity's characteristics. All instances of a given entity have the same attributes. However, the values of those attributes will be different. So if we go back to talking about students, what are some of the attributes that describe a student? Okay, yes, we know about the student number, probably your name, your address, your phone number, um, probably your home address, because you know, maybe different than the address where you stay. A lot of international students are required to stay on campus and residence, so your address is here at the school. Other students are living at home with their parents. Therefore, their home address is the same as their contact address. However, for people that aren't from Ottawa, your local address is your con your local address, and then you've got your contact address, which might be, you know, somewhere out of town, out of the country, whatever location here. Um, phone numbers, personal email address, um, date of birth. That's something they care about. Um, they probably track your, your educational history. You know, what's your highest level of education you've attained before you come to the school? That kind of thing. So those are all attributes that describe a student. It has nothing to do with your courses you're taking or any of that. It just has to do with what describes you as a student. Um, later on, I'll be talking about how we draw these. And originally, in the old school method, we used uh, ellipses to draw them. And the new one now is the rectangular form is more common. Uh, so if I go back, this right up here, this blue box, is how we draw an entity in most modern design software. And the only reason it's like that is most of the modern design software, they've gotten too lazy to include two styles of diagrams. They're like, nobody wants to use the old, what they call the Chen style diagrams from the 1980s. Everybody wants this. But that is actually harder to understand than the old style of diagram because it's really busy. There's a lot of information crammed in a small space. Uh, I'll sh show you guys the differences later. All right. So here are the two styles. You've got the modern one on the right, and you've got the old style on the left. And the cool part is about the way of doing this back in the day was, if you wanted to have just a very high level diagram, you could choose to just draw the box and not have any of the attributes on the screen, on the diagram. And later on, you'd add the attributes. So you could straight out make sure you understand how everything's related by just drawing a bunch of boxes and the the connecting lines, and then populate the attributes. And somewhere along the way, you know, as software always evolves, somebody decided, you know what, we should do this because we can just hit a button and convert that into a physical diagram when we don't need to worry about two styles of diagrams or three styles of diagrams in our application. So it is what it is. Both these are technically valid. There's just one's the old way. One is the new way. Neither one is better than the other. It depends on who you're communicating with and what you're trying to do. All right, now, identifiers. We already talked a little bit about identifiers. Um, so identifiers, as I said, is a way of uniquely identifying an instance of an entity. Student number is the school's one. Employee number would be mine as far as Algonquin's concerned. Um, So the identifier always consists of at least one attribute of the entity. So again, here at the school, you all have an attribute called student number. I have an attribute called employee number. And that is an attribute. It is part of the entity. Composite identifiers is when you have a situation where it's not where there are two candidate keys, is when the data you are given the only way to uniquely identify something is by combining two 
attributes. It's not very common, but they exist. And normally you try to avoid those as much as possible. You try to design it out of existence because it gets complicated at that point. Um, imagine if um, the system here at the school only worked by your name and your phone number, for example, right? So let's say before you get given a student number, they still have to uniquely identify you as far as the system is concerned. And they decide they're going to do it by name and phone number. That would be a composite identifier. Is it a good identifier? No. People's names change. People's phone numbers change. The combination of the two might be unique, but if any of them change, then things break. Um, identifiers eventually become keys. And so an entity has an identifier, a table when you're talking about the physical design in the end will have keys. All right, so the three ways of displaying uh, entities would be as follows. You got a fully described one over here, which includes the entity, the identifier and its attributes. You got option B, which is the entity and the identifier, or option C, which is just the entity. Option C is back to the original diagramming style I was talking about, where you just have a box with the name of the entity in it. So, as a short summary before I start talking about more stuff, an entity is a thing that we want to keep track of. We use attributes to describe it. A collection of all of the attributes for a given thing is an instance. In other words, you have a student, we have attributes that describe the student, all your personal information that applies makes you an instance. A group of students together is a class. So that is the terminology for database design. So when you're thinking about lab two, for the guys that had me yesterday and I said there's no point until you have today's lecture, because they haven't seen the words yet, these are the words we're looking for for that lab. You're looking for the entities. In other words, you're going to read through the lab and you're going to find the things. And then as you read through it, you're also going to find what describes the things, so the attributes. So you're given a paragraph of text or a list, and it'll have items you need to track, some things that help describe it. Um, and then maybe how the things are related, and we'll be talking about relationships in a bit. Uh, but that's essentially what that lab is about, is what I just spoke about for the last uh, 17 minutes. Checking my time. All right, so relational database systems. Um, now that we've gotten the theoretical words out of the way, when we take those entities, we're going to convert them into tables. And a table is made up of rows and columns. So when we want to talk about entities versus tables, attributes versus columns, instances versus row. So that each of the words in one side map out to something on the physical side and actually have a little chart and slide or two. Um, columns represent categories of data, whereas the rows represent instances. Um, and relational databases are structured to store the data, obviously, and they have relationships amongst rows of data. So in this room, we have five kinds of entities, okay? We have student, we have professor, we have course, we have term, and we have section. Now, each prof is assigned to a section. Each student is assigned to a section. Each section is a child of the term and the course. So. I have five things with five different relationships. Each prof can have more than one course. In other words, more than one section. And obviously each of you belong to more than one section because you have at least five or six courses. So that's the relationships that we're gonna be talking about, or the examples, I should say. So I do have naming conventions for this course. Um, normally I'm really stringent when I'm the only prof grading your work. However, 
there's three lab profs this term, myself and two other people. We're not going to be super stringent um, about it. I've already mentioned it to them, and I said try to remember these are the rules. But you know, as long as as long as the students stay consistent within their work. So in other words, you start the work making it look one way, and you finish that same piece of work looking the same way. That's good enough. Uh, however, um, I tend to recommend make everything lowercase. So in Java, you're going to learn about camel case, where you know you join the words by capitalizing the different. You create a variable by capitalizing the different words, right? Student capital N umber, so student number with the capital N in the middle, uh, or capital S capital N, depending on what it is you're creating. However. There's a reason why I recommend lowercase when it comes to database work, because different database products treat capitalization differently. For example, MySQL, the one we're using in this course, is totally case insensitive. It could not give, doesn't care. I was trying to find a better way of wording that. It could not care how you write your object names. It is totally case insensitive. If you type in, Capital C customer, lowercase customer, make, you go to town and make it, you know, all kind of weird. As long as it's all spelled customer, it will work. Postgres is very case sensitive. Capital C customer and lowercase C customer are actually two different objects in the database. It will actually treat them as two separate things. Microsoft SQL Server depends what language it's installed in. So if it's installed in a language that does not have you know, mixed case, for example, Cyrillic, if I, under, if I remember correctly, does not have uppercase, lowercase. It will be case insensitive. You install it uh, in North America, it is not case, it'll also be case insensitive unless you tell it to be case sensitive. It's just strange. Oracle, on the other hand, just lies uh, because it stores it the way you typed it in originally and then it stores it in uppercase. So it's case insensitive by Every time you ask for a database object, it will make it uppercase compared to what it's got in its catalog and then say, oh, this is what it really looks like. So Oracle stores it two different ways. That's just how it works. And column names, uh, again, lowercase. However, I also say you don't use spaces ever. Use underscores to separate your words. Um, it'll keep your words separate because if you're not using mixed case, how else are you going to separate your words? So use an underscore. Uh, spaces are the enemy of database work. Um, after the break, you'll learn SQL, and you'll learn that keywords are delimited using spaces. So if I go select space name, space from, space whatever customers, you'll notice that each of the keywords is separated by a space. Therefore, what happens if I go select section space number space, it's going to suddenly think that, you know, section number is a keyword, two keywords instead of an object name. So I tend to recommend use an underscore uh, because if you use a space, you need to escape the field name and every database server does it a little different. MySQL uses a backtick operator, which if you don't know what that is, that's the key above the tab that sh it's shared with the tilde. So the leftmost key after the one on your upper row of numbers. PostgreSQL uses double quotes. Oracle uses double quotes. Microsoft products use square brackets. So if you want to have a space, you've got to know which what your database engine it is. It makes you a non-portable at that point because you have to code around. So I just recommend when we're, you're defining objects, keep it lowercase. All right, yeah. A collection of entities. Yeah, it's a connection between entities, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got like five, six slides on just on relationships. So, yes, that's exactly it. It's the connection from me to my section, from you to this section, for the course and the, sec and the term to the section. The combination of all of those makes makes the relate. It's all the connection is the relation. The relationship. Not the relation. Relationship. Um, unfortunately in the database world they reuse the word relation. 
they have there's a word called relation and a word called relationship and they actually mean two different things and it's actually good because you interrupted me just on the right slide for me to talk about that um so not all tables are relations not relationship the however 99 percent of the time the term table and relation are used interchangeably. So when we talk about a physical database, a table is the same thing as a relation. And depending which database tool you are using, the tools may actually refer to as a relation versus a table. Um, for example, um, older versions of DB2, this is the big database product from IBM that runs on their mainframes, used to not you ever use the word table, it used the word relation. And then eventually they made, so it was, it didn't care which one you used, but it used to only use the phrase relation. Go figure. So in the physical database, which is the orange row, we have table, column, and row. So a table is, well, it's a table, right? The column is the different pieces that describe a row. Whereas with the um, conceptual design side, the relation, which is also an attribute, I mean, an entity. So a relationship is an, an entity. They're the same. An attribute maps out to a column. And a tuple is also the same thing as an instance. Relationship is the connection between entities. A relation is also an entity. Is the connection. Yeah. Yeah, especially when English is not your first language, you'll just see these words and they look almost the same and your brain just stops reading partway through. I get it. So a relation is an entity, is a table. A column is an attribute. A row is the same thing as a tuple or an instance. Now that last row we have on there goes back way back. Like that's the terminology you'll see used in something like COBOL. And this is where the joy of database design has gotten muddied over the years. So in system 4GLs like COBOL and Progress, they're not called tables, they're called files. They're still tables, they're just different word. And you'll see the word field. However, when you talk about database and you're interacting with a database, often, it's referred to as a field because the term means the same thing. So you'll see through the slides and through the rest of the term that you'll often see me talk about tables and columns or tables and fields. Column and fields, the same thing. A row is a row. A record is also a row. So the way you want to picture it is that last one is closer to the old concept of paper files. So. I'm sure we've all done paperwork, actually literal on paper, right? You know, fill in your name, passport application. Gotta love those. Fill in your name, fill in the rest of your stuff, right? And that is a file. Each of those things you filled in is a field. And that one, that stack of paper makes up for a single record. When it gets put into the database, it becomes a table, it goes into a table, it populates the columns, and it becomes a row. So that's the terminology. Um, this is the worst part of database design is there's so much terminology and a lot of it overlaps. So you'll have regularly um, words that get used interchangeably. So you'll talk to one person that went to school, say in Toronto to Sheridan, and they may never use the phrase row. They might use the phrase record or record set. Or you get someone that came to school here, they'll use the phrase row. You'll hit someone that went to university. They won't use the phrase row or record. They'll use tuple. Because often in university, when you're taking database topics in university, they like the word tuple. It's the same thing. There's, they're all the same thing. They're just different words that mean the same thing. We just got to accept the fact that there's words that overlap with each other. And you just got to basically build a little lexicon in your head about what these words mean. Okay. So here's two samples of two tables. Uh, one is student, one is class. Um, these are straight from the textbook. So for those of you that have gone out and bought that nice and expensive textbook, 
these some of these pictures will look familiar. The and I don't know why, but they used access to create all these screenshots. But that's fine. Good enough. So we have uh, the student table right up here. So that top one's a student. And a single row is a record, a tuple, or a row. Okay, they're all three the same thing. And then this is the class table. And the, the example here shows that this is a column. In other words, class name is a column. Each row has its own value for it. And that is the equivalent of an attribute or a field. So a column is an attribute is a field. That's all there is to that. For those of you that have used a spreadsheet, you're going to look at that and go, that's a spreadsheet. Because it looks like a spreadsheet when you're you pull it up. Even if I go to MySQL and I type in a query and I run it, it'll display to me the results in a grid. Spreadsheets are grids. Result sets are grids. The only time it doesn't look like that is when you're actually using it in programming code. Then it looks like something called an array. And that's something you're going to learn, oh, I don't know, around week 11 or 12 of your Java class. Not the database part, the part about the array. Okay. So a relation, um, a relational database obviously stores data about entities in, in their relations, and that's a special type of table. So a relation is a two-dimensional table that has the following characteristics. Rows contain data about an entity. So the row is an entity, also known as an instance. Columns contain data about attributes of the entity. So, so far, I'm just repeating things I've said, just with different words. All entries in a column are of the same kind. That's the important one. So if I go back to this, you will notice when you look at this that each column has similar data in it. In other words, if there's an email address, that column will contain an email address. If it's a first name, it'll contain people's give first names or their given names. If it's a term, obviously it'll have whatever the term happens to be. Each column has a unique name. The unique, the column is unique. The column name is unique to the table. It's not unique to the whole database. Um, way back in the day, there once was a time where your columns actually had to be unique across the entire database. Uh, that went away in like 1981, before probably most of you were born. Probably years before most of you were born. Uh, Unfortunately, not before I was born. But, you know, 1981, I didn't care. Um, but each column has a unique name. So within the table, it is unique. The cells of a table can only ever hold a single value. So if we go back here, you'll notice that going across the top, the names are unique. And each row, and, and inter, which is basically the intersection of a row and a column, so that's the cell also known as the value, only ever has one value in it. You can't store two values in one place. And it's actually a really physically easy way for you, for you guys to visualize this. Looking in this room, which is actually pretty full, can anybody sit in the same chair as somebody else? Well, without invading the personal space, right? So therefore, think of it this way. A given field for a row can only ever contain one value. In this room, we have rows and columns, right? So we got rows going this way and columns going that way. Any given intersection of a row and a column can only hold one value because it can hold one student. That's the visual way of how they can't interact with each other. Um, the order of the columns is not important. The database server could not care. So if we look at this and if we decided to have email address before last name, or you could have last name, email address, first name, the database server could not care. It doesn't care. What's important is when you feed the data that you feed it in the same way all the time. So if you define the table, that last name is first name and then email instead of first name, last name, email, as long as you add the data in there properly, it'll still work. The actual order of columns or fields is not important. And what happens often as your design database and applications evolve, you'll start adding new columns new fields, 
whichever words you want to use, to your design. And suddenly you have things that are kind of out of sequence. Who cares? The database server doesn't care. The order of the rows is unimportant. Because the database server doesn't care what order the data goes in. Therefore, whether, let's say I kicked everybody out of the room and said, okay, all of you get to come back in and you all pick a different seat. Does it make, does it stop you guys from achieving your purpose in this room? No. Because the position is not important. It's the fact that you're here that's important. The other, the only very important one is no two rows may be identical. You can't have two identical rows. Otherwise, you'll never be able to retrieve one uniquely, which is why we have keys. The keys let you make the row be unique. Back to my story for my three students of the same name. I had one term where I had three Muhammad Muhammads in my class. And the best part is, all three of them, the Muhammad was spelt the same way. So it was literally Muhammad, 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 spelt the same way. I don't know. It was just, I guess, that kind of term. It's happened. I've had a few cases where that's happened. I never had three. And if they didn't have student numbers, I would never know which Muhammad Muhammad had given me their work. Because I'd have no way to uniquely identify them. Because at that point, I have a triplicates, not even duplicates triplicate rows of information in my database, and I have no way to uniquely pick one out. Thus, I needed identifiers to be able to at least grade their work properly. So, a relation is a table. They're interchangeable. So, the most important takeaway from it is that no two rows can be identical because you'll never be able to work with it. All right. So, this is an example of an employee relation. And you'll see that this one's nice and tidy. We've got column names across the top. We've got a collection of values, which is known as a row or an instance. And there's only one single value per intersection. This is a proper relation. This is not a relation. Even though we have the same column, what's happening is we actually have multiple entries in a single intersection. So we have for actually uh, row number 400, uh, whatever, Tom Carruthers, he's got three phone numbers in one cell, which means at that point, it's no longer a proper relation because there's multiple values in one place in which you're not allowed to do that. That's something we learned in like week four, how to fix this. However, just know that this is no longer valid. There's no way to uniquely identify one of these values because of this. All right, so now we're going to talk about keys. So a key is a combination of one or more columns that use that is used to identify a particular row in a relation. Student number. That's the easiest one for all of you guys to re to re refer to. So now. When you end up with an, a table that has multiple columns that make up the primary key, that's known as a composite key. It's composite because it is made up of multiple pieces. Preferably, your key will be a single item key, but that's not always something you can do. Therefore, you also have something called composite where you end up with two pieces. Um, a common way of referring to that, uh, for you guys to visualize that is, no, there's a relation, there's a relation or and then a table called prof, there's a table called student, and it just so happens that they created a table that just maps out which students a prof has without, through the whole rigmarole of whatever. So the way we'd identify the student to the teacher in this other table would be, we'd drop in the student number and the employee number. That row would be identified by the combination of the two because the prof can't have the same student twice. So that's a composite key. Um, a candidate key, we're back to that again, is when you're starting out doing the initial design and you don't know what the identifier is for sure, we have multiple identifiers. Those are candidate keys. So a primary key is the candidate key that wins at the end of the design process. Uh, 
So you have two or three candidate keys, and we in the end we decide this is the one we're going to use. That becomes the primary key. There is only ever one primary key per table or relation. So when you're creating your table, creating your entity, you will only ever have one primary key. It is physically impossible to define two different primary keys on one table. You can create a primary key that's made up of one, two, or more columns, but it's only one primary key. You can't have two primary keys because then the database server would not know. So again, let's go with the example of the student, right? So we decided the primary key is student number. If we allowed it to also have a second primary key, a government issued identifier. So we have a student number, we have government issued identifier. So that could be a SIN number, student visa number, passport number, insert whatever here. And way back in the day, like when Algonquin College first started out, before you know, we had international students because they didn't always have international students when we first started out here. Um, I wasn't teaching here back then. That's I wasn't born when they started. They opened the school, but originally the student number was a Canadian SIN number, so our social insurance number. So whenever somebody registered as a student, you put in their SIN number. That was their student number. Identity theft wasn't that big in the 1970s. Just saying. You know, it was a lot harder to steal somebody's identity in the 70s than it is today. And that worked great. And then they started allowing international students in, but they hadn't changed their database structure yet. And one day, a student showed up and registered, and their student visa number from their country matched somebody's SIN number. They could not put that student. That new student, which was costing, you know, four times as much as the local student, they couldn't put him into the system because they couldn't put him in. Primary key said no. So imagine if they suddenly had two primary keys where you could use one or the other. That Then you'd never know which one's the right one anyway, so it doesn't work. So that's the importance of making a good primary key starter. But yes, these are things that have happened because of database design choices. So. A primary key for a table might be a single key or a composite key. If I remember right, uh, that's literally when they started generating new student numbers, but they couldn't do that in the middle of the school year. So I think they modified the database to allow the combination of a person's name and the government issued ID, because the odds of having that number plus an exact spelling for somebody else's name was kind of small. So they went with that for a while. And then I guess the next revision of access they added student numbers. Um, that's kind of cool. So back to our student and class example, we have the student table has a column called student number. That's our primary key. The class has a class number. That's its primary key. Suddenly we have a grade down here and the grade, we just have numbers. We don't even know. We have no way to know what the um, who that data belongs to. So the grades table is totally invalid. It's just a bunch of numbers. Um, so I'll be talking about surrogate keys in a minute. However, uh, surrogate keys is a primary key, but it's the values in it do not exist in the real world. Again, your student numbers here are a surrogate key because they're generated. It does not exist until it's given to you. If you ignore the 040, right, because you all start with 040, if I remember right. Actually, I think I'm up to 041 now. We've had enough students now that we've, we finally hit the four. So 04, take that off. And then the rest of that is a sequence of numbers. That Every number after the 04 has never been repeated. Every time somebody registers and is ex put into the system, they get the next number in the sequence. So I've had cases where I've had students in the same class with student numbers that were literally one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, because they follow each other because they all got processed at the same time, one after another. So your student numbers are an example of a SORG key. It has no real world meaning before it is created. Your SIN number is not a SORG key or your passport number is not a SORG key because it exists before it's put into the database. 
The surrogate key is a value that's created by the database to make itself unique. When we look at the student, again here, student number, you can see one, two, three, four. It's a sequence. Um, class number here actually jumps by tens. Obviously, those are not a sequence. Those are actually being keyed in. Um, this is pretty much a repeat of something I just finished talking about. Uh, but however, each row is identified by primary key. It's a combination of one or more columns. Makes it unique. Because uh, otherwise, you can't identify a single record. And you can't connect multiple records at once. because then there's nothing unique. Again, back to my Mohammed, 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 Mohammed version. The if we were just going based on their names, we wouldn't even know what courses they're in because we have nothing to tie them to. So, when we talk about primary keys, the better your choice for your primary key um, will help make your database lookups faster. And some hints, typo. Um, and what's worse, I noticed it last term and I didn't fix it. Uh, some hints. Usually you try to keep it short. Um, so if you're not using a surrogate key, in other words, an automatically generated value, you want to keep it short because the bigger the key is, the slower the lookups are going to be. Comparing, we tend to want to stick to numbers because numbers are faster to look up. For example, um, if we store data and we have just a number, obviously, if you're trying to find record number 56, it's going to go pretty fast to find 56. But if we're trying to find a record that has 16 characters alphanumeric, that means we need to compare all 16 characters for every row, which Imagine if with you had a textbook, and I said, okay, turn to page 59. Pretty quick, right? You flip, 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 find page 59, and you're done. However, I say, okay, I want you to flip to whatever page has this topic on it, but I don't tell you where it is in the book. You literally have to go page by page until you find that topic. So a numeric primary key is always better than pretty much everything else. Keep it simple. Again, if you can't use numbers, Avoid special characters, spaces, mixing uppercase, lowercase, because you're just going to make everything slower to look up. Just like you know how your your wonderful passwords, right? Where you've got if your password is just password, that's way easier to find than if your password is P A S S space W R D space one space two space three space exclamation mark. That's going to take a lot longer to find because it's more complex. It's the same idea. The more complex your keys, the slower the lookups are gonna be. And do not change the primary key after assigning, assigning it because that goes without saying, if you can change the primary key, it's pointless as a primary key. Once it's, it's set, it's set forever. Which leads us back to, it's better to use a number and use a surrogate key uh, because those get used up automatically. Um, the primary keys do not allow duplicates. They don't allow nulls. Uh, have you guys, God, it's only week two. So I'm just, have you guys even learned about nulls yet in programming class? Okay. A null, you're going to get a programming lesson really quick, just so you know. A null is an absence of value. It is not an empty, so you know, you have a variable, right? You've got a little box. This is a variable. This is a field. This is a column. It is defined. It exists. What we don't know is there's something in it. It's undefined. It's null. Look, it's an empty field. This is a null field. Because it's undefined, we, there's nothing in it until we look at it. It, there's no value ever set. Empty is not the same thing as a null. So a primary key does not allow nulls. Because if you don't know what it is, you can't find it. Okay? 
if it's empty, you know what it is. It's empty. You, it, the space exists, but there's nothing there. It's like some people's heads. There's a space with nothing in it. I'm not saying anybody in this room, but I'm just saying it's a space with nothing in it, right? Some people's heads are nulls. This is empty. We know it's empty because we've defined it as being empty. Now it has a value. There's batteries. Okay. It's undefined. I don't listen, just don't listen to my batteries rolling around. Right now it's undefined because we don't know what's in it. It's a null. Even though space is defined for it, it's null. A database server can never use a null as a primary key because it has a space for the primary key, but there's no, there's no way to actually compare. Therefore, it's null. And you can never have a null for a primary key because it's undefined. You have no way to. It's impossible for something to be equal to a null. No. Well, you could have one empty, but you can never have two empty because then it's duplicate. Right? So it is empty right now, right? So let's add another box just like it. Now there's two boxes that are empty, right? I tell you, I want you to pick the box on the left, but you can only use it by describing the value inside of it. Now there's two empty boxes. How are you going to describe what's in, which one I want? You can't. Because then I move the box to the other side, move the box back. You can never pick out the one box because you've got two empties. So technically, yes, you could have an empty value as a primary key once. You can never do it twice because then it's duplicated. You cannot have duplicate values because you can never find it uniquely. You can't have nulls because you have no way to actually tell it that there's something there. So, so is that kind of clear, sort of? It's about as clear as I can make it until you start playing with it. A primary key can be defined at the table level or the column level. After the break, so week eight, you will, nine, sorry, eight is when you're on break. Week nine, you're gonna learn about how to create the tables using commands, SQL. And you'll learn that you can define the primary key either per column or as part of the table as a whole. They do the exact same thing. It's just you can do it in one place or the other. That's all. Okay, surrogate keys. Surrogate keys are artificial columns. So I, we already, I already discussed it a little bit, but I'm gonna go into a little more detail. So let's say we have a case, back to my whole for an if, uh, international student that registered, with their, you know, student visa number matches the SIN number in Canada, suddenly, whoop, they can't go into the system. The way they fixed it was by adding a student number column. And the student number column is a surrogate key. It has values that are supplied automatically by the database server. It's short numeric, and it never changes, which makes it ideal for a primary key. So how many of you have gone to a place, and I bet you every single buddy in here will has experienced this. You've gone to an office somewhere, a doctor's office, uh, the school's registrar's office. You've gone to ask for help at ITS. You know, you go, you grab a number. Nobody else ever gets to have that number again, at least for that day until they reset the sequence. But that day you get that number. That number is yours for the rest of that day. It can never be reused. Whether you change your mind, you just throw it out, it can't be reused because it's been assigned to you. End of story. That is the same thing as a surrogate key in a physical manner. You pull a number out of the machine, you press the button, or you just pull the piece of tape, whatever it is, and you've got a number. That is a surrogate key because it's a synthetic value that was assigned to you at that moment. It can never change because it's set. It, it's has artificial values, it has zero meaning to users. You might not realize this, but in Access, there's all kinds of numbers that you guys don't see. You got your student number, which you guys see. However, there's probably numbers that have to do with your phone numbers. Uh, not just like, you know, like literally the phone number, but there's probably like a unique identifier tied to each phone number you register with. 
each course you've taken, uh, you'll rent a locker. There's probably a number tied to that locker that's tied to you as a student. And these numbers are probably surrogate keys. They probably just get generated on the fly every time somebody uses it. Most of the time, these values are hidden. Like, for example, when you load up a web page and there's a drop down with, I don't know, province, and you just see, you know, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Manitoba, blah, 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 the rest of the Canadian provinces. In the database, there's probably a number tied to Ontario. Whether, who cares what number it is, but it's got a number. You don't see the number. It's hidden from you because the number 10 means nothing. You go, oh, I'm in uh, political region number 10. That means nothing. Oh, that means you're in BC. Congratulations. Right? So we, as developers, we hide those numbers most of the time from our end users. There are cases where the numbers get exposed, obviously. Student numbers is a good example. An order number, right? So you, or a receipt number. So you've gone to the grocery store, you get your receipt, you'll see a receipt number on it. That is a generated number that is given to the person. It's actually meaningless to you, but it's probably on the piece of paper so they can track back that transaction. So here's a quick example of a two, the same table, one with a surrogate key, one without. So we have rental properties and we want to track the rental property. Often, if you didn't use a surrogate key, you would have to include the combination of the street, the city, the province, and probably the postal code. Um, why? Because Lots of towns have the same street in it. Um, so we can't guarantee on that. Like my hometown has a Nepean, a Nepean Avenue, I think it is. Right? Tiny little town, 10 hours north of here. Has a Nepean Avenue. There's a Nepean Street in Ottawa. Can't use that as a unique identifier. City? Great. So street plus the city. Cool. But what they ended up doing here is they decided, okay, street, city, state, plus zip slash postal code is going to be our compound key. Fantastic. So every single time we want to look up a rental property, we have to include every one of those pieces for every query. So it makes the queries a little more complicated. On the other hand, we decide we are going to add a property ID. So it's a single column that is numeric that we just added it on. Now, we don't have to be 100% accurate. We can just look up by the property ID and we can pull up the record, especially if it's a listing on a website. You'll notice often that uh, if you hover your, with the mouse over the link, sometimes it'll pop open and show you what the link is. And you'll notice that there's unique numbers to each of those. And those are unique IDs instead of complicated keys. It will make the design much simpler. Um, because what would happen in this case if we had two properties at the same address? Uh, I don't know if anybody here lives in one of the student housing uh, rentals. Not the college one here, but there's a couple on Merivale. There's a couple up on Woodruff. There's one near Cobden Road where you have a single address, 123 Some Street. But then you have six people living at the same address. Each of those rooms is rented out individually. So... If we went with the first one, we'd have to add yet another column to the key, room one, room two, room three. On the other hand, with the rental property, we could just go, you know, there's the ID to pull it up. Um, so I, this, this slide just says what I just finished saying. So a composite key, I described it also. It's when you have two more columns used for a primary key, if you can't use a surrogate key. Um, th those are not used very common. They're only used in very specific cases. Um, now, now we've finished talking about keys that identify things. We're going to have another kind of key called a foreign key. So primary keys, I think you guys pretty much understand what those are. I hope. Just spent half an hour talking about them. Primary keys uniquely identify something. A foreign key is a is a column or a field in one table whose value is equal to the primary key from another table. Okay, it sounds a little complex at first. 
However, picture it like this. We have our sections table, right? So we have a sections table. We have a student table. We have a prof table. In the sections table, we'll have two foreign keys, the prof ID and the student ID. The value in the student ID must exist in the student table. Otherwise, there's no connection. That's a foreign key. So when the value of a primary key from one table gets used in the column of another table, that is a foreign key because that value is defined elsewhere in the database. That's the, well, the parent relationship. So it allows for linking two tables. Um, so I just want to make sure I covered all the points on the slide here, but I tended to do it in my own words. So yes. So whenever you got a, again, back to my sections example, you got a student uh, section, course sections, you got the students assigned to multiple sections. And that will give the student number will be in both tables, only once in the student, but it could be in multiple sections. Um, a foreign key is a single column, obviously, because I just described it. Or it could be a composite column, because if the parent table has a composite key, the entire composite key needs to be carried down to the child table. Therefore, it's going to be a composite foreign key. Um, The term foreign key arises because the value in that column comes from a source that is foreign to that table. Um, a good example, we actually use students as an example. So you know what, we have students and then uh, they might actually have a country of origin table to say, okay, the students from China, the students from India, the students from you know Romania, take your pick. And so what's happening is we have a record for a student. The country of origin, the value in country of origin is foreign to that table because it's being pulled from somewhere else. Another table that has all the countries listed in it. That's why it's called a foreign key. The column exists. The value in it does not come from itself. It becomes from, comes from something outside of itself. Thus, it's a foreign object to itself. Um, so you'll notice the example right at the bottom of that slide, these two blocks of text down here. This is a specific notation. I cannot remember what it's called. Um, there's a really technical term for it, but usually um, it's known as a relational notation, mostly. And the way, the way it works is you have the table name, all the attributes. You'll have the primary keys underlined. And if there happens to be a foreign key, it's in, in italics. So you'll notice here that even though you have department name, in here you have a department as an italics. This is when you're talking about uh, at the design stage, not at the physical stage. So when you're doing the initial design, you'll notice that the foreign key refers to the uh, to the entity, not to the actual column, the entity. I've seen this done also with, they actually have department name here instead because some people like it being a little more precise. Check with your lab prof which one they want. Because in lab two, I think at one point it's telling you to list things off in a very similar format than this. Just double check which one your pro, your lab prof wants. I'll take it either way. Whether whether LM or Wander wants it a specific way, check with them before you commit to what you submit to them so you don't get dinged for using the wrong terminology. They're both acceptable in the field. Just depends on how um, serious they are about how they like to do things more than anything else. Okay, so if we go back to our example of our student our class and our grade. Earlier, our grades table did not have a way to identify the grade. What we've added in now is we created two foreign keys, the student number and the class number. And so in this table, 
we have a really interesting setup. So we, each of these tables have a single value primary key. So single field that makes up a primary key. In this table down here, we have um, two columns that were added in. They're both foreign keys. And what's kind of cool is these also happens to be a composite primary key. So the combination of student plus course allows us to get a single grade. Therefore, these two make up the primary key. Therefore, it's a composite key. But it also happens to be foreign keys. So in this example, you have a primary key that is everything. Like literally every kind of key I've talked about so far today. It's a primary key. It's a composite key. It's a foreign key. It's an everything key. But literally, that's a perfect example of how when you hear the phrase, it's a primary key, that doesn't, it's not exclusive. It doesn't stop it from also being a foreign key. It doesn't stop it from being a composite key. It just allows that a key can be more than one thing at once. It can be whatever it wants to be. Or I should say it can be whatever the database designer wants it to be. So that, yeah, that this slide's actually a pretty good example that covers pretty much everything I just talked about for you know, the last half hour in one picture. And there's an, an, another visual uh, where you've got the course, the student, and the course ID they're participating in. Obviously, that's not how it works here at the college because you all have more than one course. But if you happen to be signing up for a, you know, at a place that only does one-off trainings, that could apply. But it's just showing you that there's a relationship between the primary key of course ID and the foreign key in this table visually. Um, and we're back to that ugly example again. And the fixed example. Why? All right. So if we were going to draw this as a um, conceptual diagram, so this is an access. Access by default draws everything as conceptual diagrams. So remember when right at the start when I was showing you, you know, you can draw this either with boxes and ellipses, or you can draw it only as um, boxes with the, with the columns in it. This is basically what it's doing here, except it's also including the relationship. This notation's not great, but it's a, how it looks. Okay, so how do you know when to not to use or not use a key? So there's this data scientist in the seventies. Um, I don't remember his first name, but his name was Cod. Obviously, it's on the slide, but there was a guy whose last name was Boyce. There's another guy whose last name was Chen. There's another guy whose last name was Cod. So those are the three big last names in the world of database that basically fundamentally created everything there is about database. Um, so Cod defined a relationship as being every row in a relation must be unique. However, there's no requirement for a primary key. You could create a table without a primary key as long as every column, the combination of the entire row is unique. The requirement for unique row implies that a primary key can be designed. So if the entire row has to be unique, obviously there's a way to make a primary key out of it. However, in the real world, every table is going to have a primary key. It's, it's just bad design to not have a primary key on a table. Uh, so when do we designate a primary key? Usually we need more information because we, there's, you know, comes down the road. Um, so now we're going to talk about relationships. Entities uh, can be associated uh, with one another using relationships because he brought it up, whatever, 40 minutes ago. We're talking about relations versus relationships. So relationships are the connections between entities. Prof, student, course to how we interact with, how each of those tables or entities interact, that's the relationships between them. And so you got relationship classes. So a relationship class is the association amongst entity classes. So remember earlier I was talking about how we have an entity, you have an instance and a bunch of instances makes for an entity class. 
the relationships between all those different instances makes up the relationship class. A relationship instance is the one connection between two rows of data. So for example, your CST8215 lecture prof, there is only one relationship between each of you and me. And I only have, although I have many students, I have one relationship per student. Each student has one relationship with me. And that is an instance of a relationship. So it's the connection between two records or two entity instances or two rows, whatever phrase you want to use. And a class is the fact that, you know, there's multiple relationships of all the same type in this room. Um, a relationship can involve two or more um, entities, obviously, because realistically, it's not straight from you to me. It's from me to course section, from you to course section, course to course section, term to course section. So this one, the section is a combination, has four different relationships. So relationship can involve multiple entities. In the end, it's how they all interact, which makes it all up. Um, so the degrees of a relationship is the number of entity classes in a relationship. And if you have two entities, it's known as a binary relationship. If you have three entities, it's a ternary relationship. And then they gave up after that. They just, you know, at that point, they didn't come up with another name because you could have four, five, six. The course section is a perfect example, right? You've got course, you've got student, you've got term, you've got professor. So you've got four feeding into a single relationship in the middle. So that's actually a quaternary relationship. However, the funny thing is, is that each of those objects in there are in a binary relationship because a course section only ever belongs to one course. A course section only ever belongs to one term, you know. So there's binary relationships at the same time. So an example of a binary relationship would be an employee and their skills. An employee has skills. A skill belongs to one or more employees. Um, on the other hand, a ternary relation would be a client, an architect, and a project. All three of them are interacting in a single object. I, I like using my course section one because that's something you guys are all experiencing right now. So it's more real. Um, so we haven't even defined these right now. We're defining them right now. Um, this is a terrible slide. So the main integrity constraint we're going to talk about domain integrity constraint, entity integrity constraint, and referential integrity constraint. So there's three constraints. When you take them together, it'll give you database integrity, uh, which means at that point, the data in the database will be useful. So domain integrity constraint. It's a really complicated phrase to say that all the values in a given column hold the same kind of data. That's literally what domain integrity constraint means. If you have a column that's set to store dates of birth, everybody in here has a date of birth. Man, I hope everybody in here has a date of birth. Everybody has a date of birth. You're not going to put a person's name in their date of birth. Domain integrity rules state that if you're defining a date of birth, it's going to hold date of birth. So, the term domain means a grouping of data that meets a specific condition. So if we use first name, you could have a domain of names, and they give you a list here, right? So we've got Albert, Bruce, Kathy, David, Edith, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All values of first name must come from the names in that domain. Realistically, we will never define all the potential values for that domain. It's essentially saying that every value in that column has to be of the same type. That's all. Now, as I already said this one earlier before, a column name can be found in multiple tables. Theoretically, the same domain integrity could apply to more than one place. Student record, 
employee record. We both have first names. Technically, they have the same domain because they both are first names, but they happen to be in two different bins. So that's what that's saying. Okay, so entity integrity constraint. So this was pretty straightforward. It means that when you create a row of data, the primary key must have a unique value. So that makes the entity safe. It maintains the integrity because each of you have a student number, it maintains your integrity in the system. So if you just happen to want to change your name, you change your gender, change your address, change your phone number, you can change almost everything about yourself except for your student number. I've had a case where somebody had to change their date of birth. I've seen it. Well, they literally had to get a new birth certificate in their case, but, you know, they had to prove it. But it's happened where a person for their entire lives thought they were born on one day, and then finally the real records came out, and they were actually like six months younger. Bad record keeping. In some parts of the world, record keeping is not exactly a good thing. Other parts of the world, not so much. I mean, my I can use my mother as an example. She has, she I literally had two birth certificates, two different names. And why? Because she had the birth certificate issued by the church and the birth certificate issued by the government. The guy at the church wrote her name one way. The government put it in a different way. So she literally had two birth certificates, two different names. And they had a different date. Because the church marked the date differently. Right? So this is an example of how somebody's date of birth could change. Like depending which birth certificate she used, her date of birth could change. Uh, it was kind of weird. It's kind of cool. Uh, record keeping, an example of bad record keeping. Everything was on paper in 1933. Right? Everything was on paper, obviously no computers. And record keeping was only as good as the person's handwriting. All right, so entity integrity constraint means that the primary key will have a unique value and it can never change. Uh, it also means that it will never be null because it's not null because you cannot have null as your primary key because it's physically possible for a primary key to be null because it's impossible for something to be equal to null. Either it is null or it is not null. You cannot be equal to null. There's no such thing. How can it be equal to the absence of value? And referential integrity constraint means when you have a foreign key, the value in the foreign key must exist in the parent entity, the parent table. So student number 1234 gets added to a course. Student number 1234 is in that course listing as a student. However, we couldn't add student 4567 unless student 4567 already exists. You cannot add a value in a foreign key unless it already exists in the parent record. That's what re referential integrity means. You cannot invent data that is being referenced elsewhere. Unless you're ChatGPT. Hey, I mean, I'm part of a Reddit subreddit for pro for professors. And it's like our number one way of finding when people cheat because they'll use references for things that do not exist. They'll say, I need an essay that talks about this just 10,000 word essay. And then it literally has essay references to things that do not exist because it made them up. That will never work because those references don't exist. Therefore, the referential integrity of those references is invalid. Therefore, it's no longer constrained. All right. So, oh good, we're on pace. We'll be done very shortly. I hope. Cardinality. Cardinality means the count. And cardinality is a strange concept in database because we use the phrase minimum and maximum cardinality. But realistically, we have minimum cardinality and then we have more. There's no such thing as a maximum. So minimum cardinality means the number, the minimum number of relationship instances which it must participate. Maximum means is what's the maximum number it can participate in. 
So a minimum cardinality, and I bet you this is going to be in the following slides, usually is zero or one. Zero means the relationship is optional. For example, you register as a student. You are not assigned to any courses yet. That means the relationship from you to, stu to course is optional. So you have a zero minimum cardinality from student to course. However, if there's something that is mandatory, um, you have a health record. So you go to your doctor's office and you are required to at least have one health record. So that means the minimum cardinality is one. You must have at least one of these. Maximum cardinality means you can have one or more. In other words, either it's a one-to-one -one relationship where there's only one entry going back and forth, which is actually really not that common, or you have more. Again, you guys get registered in multiple classes. Therefore, because you're taking Java, you're taking math, taking database, so your relationship from you to your classes is one or more. Zero, one or more, right? You have zero courses. You could have one courses. You could have more courses because you really don't have an upper limit of how many courses. Well, there's mentally an upper limit, but physically, there's no upper limit of how many courses you can be assigned in a given term. Therefore, the relationship from you to course is zero, one or more. We usually, at that point, we skip the one. We say zero or more. But really, it's zero, one or more. So we have parent and child entities. So these are one to many relationship. Here's a good example. One prof, many students. So I'm the parent entity. You guys are the child entities. Um, so that just means that I so the relationship goes like this. You have one prof, I have many students. So it's a one to many, a parent child relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one prof, many students in a course, not necessarily in a program, but I'm using that as a, as a quick example. Really, there's other things in between, but the relationship in this room is one to many. So one of me, many of you. So the way the relationship is read is for you guys to be one, at least one, and only one prof for lecture. I have zero or more students because when they assign me the course, I have no students. They know we're going to have students. They assign me the course, and then magically one day I go from zero students to many students. So one to many, or many to one, depending on how you want to read that relationship. An example we have here is an employee has one or more computers, but the computer can only ever belong to one employee at a time. Unless you work in a call center, then the computers belong to everyone. But how many people in here have more than one computer? In your life right now, how many do you own? One or more, right? If I, I'm not even going to pretend that there isn't at least four computers in my office in my house. Right? However, each of those computers belong to me. I have many computers. Each of those computers belong to one person. So maximum cardinality describes on how many times they can participate in a relationship. So there's three kinds of maximum cardinality. One to one, one to many, and many to many. Many to many would be the example of you guys in all your courses, right? So each of you have many professors. Each professor has many students. Thus, it's a many to many relationship. I have two courses. That means I've got 180 students this term, right? And each of you have at least, well, even for this course, some of you have two profs for this course, right? You got those that have a lamb and wander, you have me, so you have two. So it's a many to many relationship. A one to one relationship is when it's only a single connection between the two. Uh, they're not very common in the database world. Um, Here's a couple of examples. An employee to a badge is a good example of one-to-one. -one. Or you're 
student to you pass. One to one, right? One student, one you pass. One to one relationship. There isn't multiple people in that you pass, and each person doesn't have multiple you passes. Employee to computers, already discussed that one. And then you got employees to skills. That's another good example because you could have a list of skills and a list of employees, and some employees will have the same skills as other employees. Therefore, those skills belong to multiple employees, and each employee's, you hope your employees have more than one skill. Because that's a very single purpose job. Okay. So, I'm right on time. So, this hit the end of that. Now, I am going to show you guys uh, a quick little website that's really handy for drawing uh, ERDs. Because there's one of the labs that asks you to draw ERDs. And because I want to show you guys really what the de some of the diagrams look like. Um, Okay, so this website's called eodplus.com. It's free, by the way. So you can register here for free. It's free to use. Uh, it was actually created by textbook authors. Not the textbook that we're using, but it was created by textbook authors. Uh, and they really like the old way of doing NAD relationship diagrams. Um, so remember earlier I said there's the old style of doing the diagrams? This is what this website does. It does the old way of doing it. So you have an entity. So let's go with our uh, our students, right? So we have student. And we are going to add another entity. Uh, we're gonna call this one um, profs. And we're gonna add another entity called term. And add one more entity called uh, course. So we got four entities, fantastic. Now we wanna connect everything. So we can actually add one more entity like this, and we're gonna call this uh, section. And we can actually create connections from student to section. And prof to section, term to section, course to section. and. This is the old style of an ERD. Right now, what you're seeing on the screen is the boxes refer to entities. The diamonds describe the relationship. Um, and what's cool about this one is you can actually um, you can actually describe the relationship right here. Uh, no, it soon doesn't teach it. Uh, so it makes it fairly easy to read. So at this point, this diagram is very, you could take this and bring it to a person that has never learned database and still be able to explain to them how things are interrelated. That's the point of this really old style ERD diagram. It keeps visually very simple for people. Now, if we wanted to get a little fancier, we could create what's called an extended ERD, which at which point we will add some attributes. And when you're def when you're creating um, a conceptual diagram, you don't have to worry about naming conventions as much because it has nothing to do with the database server. Um, course name. And description like that. And now we've managed to describe course. We could choose to say that this is the identifier because it's unique. The course code should be unique. Um, and now I'm going to jump over to the student just to show that. Um, you will notice that we didn't talk about any relationship notation in this lecture. That's going to be next week when we talk about diagramming a little more. Uh, but if anybody decides to, when lab three drops, that gives you a good start, this tool. 
We can add attributes in here and we'll have again, the student's name, uh, stu, student number, you know that's unique. Okay, now I'm gonna create another one. I'm gonna add a new attribute called address. Address is a composite attribute. It's an attribute that's made up of more than one thing. Because realistically, human brains are really, really good at understanding the concepts of things. If I say to you, what's an address? Pardon? Yeah, but I don't want to know your specific address, so it makes up an address. Hey? Okay? I didn't catch that. Yeah, there's like street numbers. There's the street. Yeah, example, so 101 baseline, Ottawa, Ontario, K2C, 1K1. So what was that? That's an address, but that's made up of four or five pieces, right? It's a composite attribute. Normally when you're doing physical design, I'll talk about this next week, but when you're doing physical design, you take these composite attributes and you explode them into its component pieces. However, this tool allows you to actually put the notation right in it. Whereas with the, the boxed format, the one that goes up and down, the composite attribute will, you'll basically put brackets inside the box instead. Or you'll put it in and then you'll list off all the pieces. So I could add a component piece here like And you can see that the address is one piece. So in the other design tool, you'd put it in a common delimited list. So this is just showing you guys, you know, take note of this tool because you'll need it or you'll need something similar to this for lab three. Um, so, but the, that's essentially what the pieces are when you're diagramming it. So it's kind of handy to know what this tool exists um, because the, the, the license for Visio that we're all using here doesn't support ERD diagrams. So you get Visio for free with Office 365 and we're on the cheap license and we can't use it, can't create ERD diagrams with it. Good job. Um, so, you know, you use something like this or you use draw.io or whatever it's called now, just change names um, or some other diagramming tool, but none of them are made purpose built for this. This one's purpose built. That's literally what this website is for. So it's good to know. All right, that is it for today. Um, you guys have a hybrid coming up soon. Let me just pull up, uh, make sure that it's visible for you guys. Content. Doo -doo -doo. Um, hybrid tasks. Yes. So hybrid week one, week two, essentially you're going to read those. And under quizzes, I'm going to put a link in the announcement for you guys. Um, and I need to update it because it's not showing the right date here. Hot darn. So the date on that will be fixed very shortly because it's still due in February. Last term. Um, the hybrid quiz will become available for you guys. You will have one week to do it. And you'll get the announcements and everything that goes with it. Uh, that's the only other thing that I really had to worry about for you guys. All right.